welcome back to the main stage. I hope you have enjoyed your sessions and made some new friends through the carousel, networking carousel. Now, whilst people are joining us, I thought we could once again review the world of Twitter and see what people are saying about hashtag XO2021. So, Dorothy, mm -hmm. first tweet from <laughs> Christian. Knowledge takes time. You can't speed it up. Wise words from Alexandra, particularly in times of a pandemic. The need for basic research has mm -hmm. never been higher. Absolutely right. agree. Yeah. Uh, lots and lots of tweets on the decolonizing museums uh, mm. session that just happened. And here's a lovely quote. It's about sharing power. If the story is not mine to tell, why don't I have the humility to engage with communities? Incredible words from Elizabeth Razakola there. You're going to love this one, Dorothy. So <laughs> we've had people watching us from their home, from their office, from outside, and now we've got somebody from Explorer watching us from their car. Why? Don't know if you can see that. That wow. is ded dedication to the conference. Uh, also, Sarah Delaunay makes a great point. It's a solar eclipse and a talk by John Falk. What a day. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And then finally from Dr. how museums and science engagement organisations could make citizens connect or reconnect with nature. A critical issue to respond to a planetary crisis. Fantastic examples yeah. from NHM London, my own place. Good, <laughs> good work team. Uh, the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in America and also the NHM in Denmark. So some great tweets coming from all across the sessions. Keep them coming. Perfect. Now, to introduce Professor John Wolfold, our second keynote, I'd like to invite Miko Milikowski to join me. Hello, Hello Miko. You are the chairperson of the annual conference program committee, a dedicated bunch of people from across Europe who come together every year to help bring you our conference. Miko, first, am I going to audio describe you? So, you have no more hair than brown, and despite the Finnish sun, your skin is white. You have a round face with a big mouth, and when we smile, which you always do, your eyes are shaped like your lips. Your joy of life is very communicative. I hope you like that, Miko. And tell Perfect, me, Dorothy. are you enjoying the conference so far, Miko? I am, and you, Dorothe and Brad, are setting the bar so high for all the appearances. So I took a friend with me. <laughs> a reminiscence from an exhibition, Nordic Explorers, that we were touring in Europe exactly 25 years ago. Mm, wow. <laughs> and uh, this portrays the illness, maybe, adapt to this year as well. Uh, it's, it's displaying like the fears and dangers that the explorers are facing when they do their mm. expeditions. Oof. Now, for our audience members, please do write any questions for John in the Q&A tab and upvote your favorites. And now I must hand over to Miko to introduce our very special keynote. Thank you, Dorote. It's really a privilege to be on stage, especially for John Falk, because he is such a seasoned professional who has been helping museums and cultural institutions across the world. Uh, museums of all kind, ours here at Heureka included. John is a founder and the director of Institute for Learning Innovation in, in the United States. He's based in Oregon, Cornwallis, uh, where he also was a uh, C grant professor for free choice learning at the Oregon State University. And I have to say, probably the only free choice learning professor in the world. Personally, for me, John is the reason why I seldom use the word informal learning, because I hate describing stuff through negation. Free choice learning is also one of the keys, I think, to today's talk that John is going to have with us about his upcoming book, The Value of Museums. John's production is incredibly important for our field. Many of us 
remember and have read the museum experience, which has also appeared as an updated version recently. We remember him from the global impact study where he was orchestrating this global effort of the science center field. And last but not least, uh, in fact, a very key work for us here at Heureka is Identity at the Museum Visitor Experience from 2009. So, John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for everything that you have done so far. But most importantly, thank you for what you are going to deliver soon, because I happen to know that you are really taking an important and interesting step uh, in a way forward. But should I also say backward, because we also know that you are a biologist by training. And interestingly enough, your recent book will link to your early origins and also the early origins of human beings. So yes. please, John, the sh screen is yours, the stage is yours. We will enjoy. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you so much, Miko, for that introduction. And I'm just thrilled to be here, um, here virtually, I guess, um, talking to folks at Aztec, um, <laughs> Excite. Um, it's early in the morning for me, so I apologize. Um, and uh, I am going to talk about this whole issue of the value of science museums, or museums in general, but I'm going to focus on science museums. So the premise of this talk um, is that too often science museums have been considered nice, but not necessary. And Clearly, that's a reality we would like to change. And to do that, I would argue that we need to define and measure the value of science museums in ways that policymakers um, can appreciate and respect. So where do we start in this search for the value of science museums? And frankly, it's a search that, as Miko suggested, I have been on for more than 40 years with lots of twists and turns. And where one should always start is with data. So what do users themselves find important? So I'm going to share four bits of data, but obviously this, these are representative of lots and lots of data. So this is Fred. In 1978, I interviewed Fred on an airplane. He had the misfortune of sitting next to me. Um, and we started chatting, and I started chatting him up. And I mentioned to him that I worked at that time for the Smithsonian Institution. And I asked him, have you ever been to the Smithsonian? And his answer was, oh, it must have been nearly 40 years ago since I was at the Smithsonian. I went with my family, my father, mother, and older brother. I was eight or 10 years old. We went as part of a family vacation. I said, wow, that was a long time ago. What do you remember about the visit? And he told me a whole bunch of things. But then he said, the thing I remember best seeing the spirit of St. Louis. It was suspended from the ceiling. I had heard about it in school and I marveled at the history. I idolized Lindbergh and seeing that plane made me even more in awe of his accomplishment. I had never realized that Lindbergh couldn't even see in front of him as he flew, that he was flying blind. I was inspired and went home wanting to be like him. This is Sarah and in 2006, um, as part of a National Science Foundation, US NSF funded project, we interviewed Sarah at her home roughly two years later uh, after her visit to the California Science Center. So when you went to the Science Center two years ago, what was the purpose of the visit? What? And she said, well, to see what I could learn. Not that I'm the most intelligent person, but you know, science is always updating and finding new things. So what do you remember most? What was most memorable? I remember the babies in the jars. That was very interesting to me. Why? Because I was really able to see the different stages of the pregnancy, real bodies. I had seen similar things in books, but seeing the real thing really made a difference. It allowed me to actually see the size and shape in a way that no picture ever could. This is Bill with his son, Luke. And in 2006, Again, one of my colleagues interviewed Bill by phone. Again, this was after a visit to the California Science Center. <clears throat> you remember your visit to the Science Center six months ago? Yes, I remember looking forward to taking my son to the museum. I was just gonna be with him, him and me. 
I remember best something we both got really excited by. It was an interactive computer program to add sound to moving film to show how sound added to our senses of fear or anxiety. We made the film scary. We also bought a book about movies in the gift shop. We read the book later at home and talked about it. He really loves horror movies. And then finally, um, this is Francis. And in 2007, I interviewed Francis over the phone. So do you remember your last visit to a museum? Do you consider a botanical garden a museum? She said, oh yeah. Uh, have you been to a botanical garden recently? Well, I went to the Berkeley garden about a month ago. So what do you remember about this visit to the garden? Do you remember any particular plants or labels? Um, Francis says, no, I can't remember any particular plant or label. Label, and she actually chuckled. Actually, I hardly ever look at the displays or the or the labels. To be honest, often the plants are just wallpaper for me. What I do remember is feeling really relaxed and peaceful. The sun was out and it was warm. It was such a beautiful place. I find that going there helps me unwind. So, what do we make of this? Four users, four outcomes. So, Fred, the sense of awe, identity, fulfillment, Sarah intellectual curiosity and exploration is what she remembers. Bill was a social connection and the bonding and nurturing of his son. Francis, physical and mental recharging. So two key questions arise. Specifics aside, can we assume that these are generalizable and predictable types of outcomes? And do these types of benefit outcomes have any value? And the answer to both of these questions is yes. So how do we make sense of this? A key feature, I would argue, in fact, the primary feature that stands out for me in all these examples was the durability and the salience of these people's memories. And memories they were, the shortest memory was a month ago, Francis. The oldest, the longest was more than 40 years old. But despite the time lapse, whether it was a month, um, six months, two years, 40 years, all these individuals were able to readily recall and talk about their experience. And frankly, that's pretty amazing since most of us can't remember what we did yesterday, let alone last week, let alone 40 years ago. And I believe the path to understanding the value of museum experience begins here. Why should museum memories, why should, their, why should these experiences be so memorable? Why should memories be so salient? <clears throat> so let's talk about memory. Um, what do we know about human memory? Well, the first thing is that, as I said, we have trouble remembering what we did yesterday, let alone 40 years ago. And that's because we remember relatively little of what happens in our lives. We typically only remember things that we perceive as meaningful. Meaningful things are memorable. The rest just disappears. Um, and we use those meaningful memories, though, um, to help us. These are the, what we would call knowledge, learning, past experience. These are all important. And the reason they're important to people is because we use them in order to navigate the world, to make choices about what we do next. We build future experiences, we build future choices based on our memories and past experiences. But how does a person determine what is meaningful? Things that impact them, um, that affect their well-being is what, by definition, we define as memorable. Ah, but then we get to the question, what is well-being? Now, unfortunately, well-being is a much uh, used and I would argue abused word these days. And typically the way we use well-being today is talked about primarily as a psychological phenomenon, um, often a, as a synonym for happiness or health. And although health and happiness are part of what is well-being, it's actually a much deeper construct than that. First and foremost, I would argue, that well-being is a biological, survival-related phenomenon. The ability to perceive well-being is nothing short of how life evolved 
to understand whether they are fit or not in a Darwinian sense. You can't know whether you're fit or not. That's an abstract idea. But life has evolved the ability to perceive when things are going well or when things are going poorly. Because in the long run, those things correlate, evolutionarily speaking, with fitness. And things that manage to maximize their positive well-being and minimize their negative well-being are more likely to survive and thrive. Our friend Charles Darwin um, was the one who pointed this out. And basically, this preservation of favorable variations and destruction of in Jurious variations I call natural selection or survival of the fittest. Now, typically, the way biologists have talked about that is through um, genetic fitness, um, as encoded in the genes. But every organism actually has agency and has the ability to influence its moment to moment behavior in ways that also benefit its fitness. Um, it's why we evolved the ability to sense um, heat. So when we put our hand on the stove and pull it away, um, we learn to, um, now pulling our hand away was a genetic response, but learning to not touch a hot stove again, that's not genetic, that's behavioral. And every living thing has learns to avoid things that make them sick or things that create a danger or pain. And likewise, they learned to be able to, to positively do things again that enhance their positive well-being, like finding a mate, um, learning things that make them feel good. Unfortunately, well-being, particularly positive well-being, is always ephemeral. Um, it doesn't last. And so we're constantly in pursuit. It's a never-ending pursuit for well-being, never-ending pursuit to avoid getting sick or hurt, and a never-ending pursuit to try and feel good, um, to have friends, to have social relationships, to be in love, all those things. So it's a very basic thing, but what does this look like in human beings? Well, actually, each of us has evolved thousands arguably tens of thousands of ways to enhance our well-being. But all of these fall into four basic types or categories. So the most recently evolved, some 350,000 or more years ago, is the whole category of what I'm calling personal well-being. And these are the feelings of satisfaction that come from amazement and wonder, from feeling like your identity is confirmed and actualized. Um, humans are notable. They're the only organisms that will sit for hours um, in front of a waterfall and enjoy the waterfall, the awe of the waterfall. A gazelle will just walk by that waterfall, but not people, awe. And this whole sense of self-actualization, these are uniquely human experiences. And the kinds of experience that Fred ex um, had when he visited the Smithsonian um, those many, many years ago are an example of that sense of awe and fulfillment and identity building. Another very human characteristic, but not unique to human, shared by our higher ape relatives, and therefore it evolved at a minimum some six million years ago, probably longer than that, ago, and also fueled by consciousness, um, is the satisfaction from being able to consciously exercise a sense of choice and control over our world. Every living thing wants to have choice and control over their world, but humans have harnessed and higher apes have harnessed conscious awareness to do this. And um, we use our knowledge to try to predict and to the degree understand what happened in the past and to the degree influence current and future events. And that clearly is what Sarah was doing when she was talking about um, understanding something about her own pregnancies and other pregnancies in the human development process when she saw those babies in the jar, intellectual exploration and empowerment. Far more fundamental is this whole sense of social well-being, the origins of higher 
uh, of multiple cellular organisms being social goes back more than 600 million years ago. Um, and sexual um, reproduction's origins start about, um, about uh, the same time, uh, even about a billion years ago. But um, the again, the conscious awareness, the primate, ability to use um, social relationships and navigate through social relationships by being consciously aware, a degree of consciously aware of hierarchies and um, this whole notion of self-esteem and feeling good about oneself in relationship to others. Um, that's more recent, but it's a fundamental human characteristic. Um, we're highly social creatures and we derive an enormous amount of satisfaction by being with family and with friends and loving those people, but also being feeling loved and respected by them as well. And clearly this was something that Bill was enacting as he was took his son to the Science Center to spend a quality time with him. And his memories were all about those social relationships that he had with his son on that day. And then final, finally, physical well-being. Um, and this goes back to the very roots of evolution itself, some 3.8 billion years ago. And the 2 billion year marker was when we evolved sexual reproduction. Um, but people are subject to a host of basic needs and desires, hunger, thirst, rest, security, safety, health, the desire for sex. And fulfilling these basic needs is very satisfying. And despite the fact that most people who talk about learning and psychology tend to ignore these things, uh, we humans spend a disproportionate amount of every day, more than half of our day, um, arguably two thirds of every day, seeking to fulfill these type of basic physical well being needs. And people use places like museums, things like the Botanical Gardens, Francis is an example, to satisfy those physical security and wellness needs. And as the COVID pandemic highlights that if we don't feel safe in these settings, we're not gonna go to these settings. So what do we do about this? So if these kinds of outcomes, personal, intellectual, social, and physical well-being, are actually critical, fundamental outcomes that we can see people who use science museums derive. Um, how do we wrap our arms around that? How do we measure these outcomes? And as I suggested, the key to measuring this is appreciating that persistence of these, the strength of these and how they persist over time is critical to measuring them. And the longer well-being lasts, the greater is its value. It also suggests that despite the fact that we've spent decades, years, under trying to understand and measure the outcomes of museums' experiences by talking to people as they're walking out the door of our museums, we're missing the point. Because the real value in these experiences is not what happens in the moment, it's what persists over time. Um, and so, if we are merely measuring it as they're walking out the door, we're actually missing the majority of the value that has been derived. So I set about trying to measure these values and lo and behold, I was able to measure enhanced well-being. And this is a table uh, with a bunch of numbers in it. Um, and uh, this represents a pilot I did with six institutions across three different countries. Um, there was um, Billings Farm, which was a living history um, farm in upstate New York in the US. History Nebraska, which was a, base, a small basic history museum in the Midwestern part of the US. Uh, Museum in Toronto, which is actually a virtual museum in Canada. Um, also the Toronto Zoo in Canada. The Museum of Life and Science, which is a sort of a indoor outdoor science and nature museum in the southern part of the United States <clears throat> and our own Herica in Finland, um, which is an interactive science center. And um, 
And the numbers went from one to five, with one being when we talked to these people, um, did you have with a whole set of outcome data in terms of their personal, social, physical, and intellectual well-being? Um, did do you have these kinds of experiences? Yes or no? And if no, they not at all. If yes, did they la last for an hour or two, basically while you were there at the at the museum? Did they last for a day? Um, did they last for at least a week? Did they last for two weeks or more, which is five? And in the table, you can see there are a couple fives, which suggests that in this pilot study, um, I arbitrarily picked two weeks or more as the endpoint. Um, and if the mean from all the people who answered was five, that means everybody answered that it lasted two weeks or more, that in future research, I'm gonna have to extend that for a month or maybe even longer um, because there was a ceiling effect. But you can see that the group means um, for personal well-being was a four, which meant it lasted a week, at least a week. For intellectual well-being, it lasted three and a half, 3.5, which is somewhere between a day and a week, so several days. Uh, for social well-being, it lasted um, two weeks, at least uh, a week or more. Um, and for physical well-being, it was a three, which again was um, uh, lasted for at least um, a day. So longer than just being at the museum for at least a day, in some cases a week, and in other cases more than a week. Well, this is great data. Um, this is really convincing that we have an impact. But I'm here to tell you that as wonderful as this data is, this isn't going to convince policymakers of the value of science museums. Because remember, that's the goal of this talk. Coming up with a way to talk about value that's going to convince people like this. So the question is, um, how do you do that? Well, first of all, value is always relative. Value is not an absolute. Value is comparative. I value this in comparison to that. I have no other way to determine value. And so how do people like this, these lovely European bureaucrats is an image that I got. Um, how do people like this make those kind of value comparisons? And the answer, whether you like it or not, is money. Policy decisions are ultimately decisions about the allocation of money. Money is the common denominator. Money is what they have and money is what they give. And they, they use that indicator of value to determine public good, such as healthcare, safety, science museums, whatever. And they have to determine whether the benefit is worth the cost. <clears throat> and the most common way of doing that is something called return on investment, ROI which is basically a very simple formula. It's you figure out what the benefit is in dollars or euros or pounds or whatever your currency is, and you divide that by the cost. And in general, in the for-profit world and even in the nonprofit world, anything in excess of 110% is considered a good return on investment. So just to be clear, 100% return on investment is break even. So <clears throat> one euro in, one euro out is 100% return on investment. 110% return is one euro 10 cents of benefit for every euro in cost. And of course, anything greater is considered excellent. So how do you measure science museum return on investment? It's actually a multi-step, a five-step process, I would argue. So step one is you have to figure out how to measure um, the thing that you're interested in, in this case, enhanced well-being. So that's what that first step was all about, measuring enhanced well-being. The second step is you have to convert all that um, enhanced well-being into money, into, in this case, euros. And that 
my friends, is a non-trivial task. And the reason for that, and this has been tried many times before, I'm not the first person who's tried to figure out how to put a euro value, a monetary value, um, on museum experiences. But I would argue that virtually all past efforts to assign a monetary value to these kinds of experiences were underestimates. And there's a reason for that. There were two inherent problems. The first was when you asked economists to measure, um, what were you measuring? And historically, museum people didn't have a good sense of what an appropriate outcome should be. And they often talked about, certainly now in the US, and also in Europe, there's some efforts to measure social values or social outcomes. There are also, particularly in the UK, have been efforts to measure well-being. But what they're using are these um, crazy, really, really um, long-term outcomes. So um, they're using the annual measure in the UK of the annual survey of well-being, or they're measuring like in the US, they're measuring um, divorce rates or um, uh, annual income levels or you, you name it, things like outcomes like that. Well, that's great, but, but you know, we're talking about a couple hour visit to a science center. How is that going to um, influence your annual health or your, um, or your whether you're married or not? It could, but that's so distant from that experience. Those aren't valid measures. You actually have to measure things that relate to important outcomes, but actually are directly tied to the experience itself. And historically, that has not been the case. But there's been another significant bias, and this is what I call the price value bias. We as consumers, and we're all consumers, we live in a consumer world, we're conditioned to believe that price equals value. So that if I go to buy um, something at the store, what I pay at the store must be its value. Otherwise, why would somebody charge me that price? Because in the for-profit world, there is a direct correlation, one-to-one -one correlation between price and value. And obviously, sometimes you can get a little cheaper or a little more expensive, but in general, price and value are highly correlated. But the price of a museum experience is not equivalent to its value. We have worked really hard to separate price and value. We subsidize museum experiences. In many cases, admission to our institutions are free, or at the very least, they aren't reflective of the true price it costs to create those experiences. Because we have grants, we have government funding, and we are highly motivated to reduce that price. So in order to accurately assess the monetary value of museum experiences, you need to both have an appropriate value to measure and you need to be able to disassociate the valuation process. How much do you think this outcome is worth from the museum itself? So you can't ask people again. So when you went to the museum, what was that worth? Because they'll say, well, I don't know, cost me about 30, 40 euros, including transportation or whatever to get there. So it must be a 30 to $40 value. Um, or euro value or whatever they whatever the algorithm they re they reach. So if you do that though, you can then measure the perceived value. And then step three is you combine those results. So you now know what the value of an outcome is, you know what the outcome is, you combine those to create the value of, of the experience. You multiply that mean value by the total number of participants who have that experience. That gives you the total value of the experience for all the people who participated. And you divide that <clears throat> by the total cost of the whole experience. So what does it cost? For example, if you know that, that you had, that the average cost of a visit to Herica was X and you had so many visitors to Herica in a year and it cost Y amount to run Herica for a year, 
then you can calculate the return on investment. And when you do that, and here are just three examples, you find that, for example, the Billings Farm, the mean value of that experience was 369 euros for Toronto Zoo. The mean value as determined by those measurements was 389 euros and Herica was 344 euros. So order of magnitude, we're talking about um, the value of museum experience is about 350 euros per person. Um, and the return on investment is an eye popping, you know, thousands. In the case of Herica, it was 12,000 plus percent. That means for every euro spent to keep the doors of Hernica open, that institution returned 127 plus euros in value. Now, as I said, this is return on investment is the coin of a realm. So how do we make this comparison? So I'll give you some quick examples. And it turns out, even though everybody talks about return on investment, and in the, <clears throat> the for-profit world, they measure that assiduously. <clears throat> um, finding that data in the nonprofit world turns out to be much more difficult. But we can have some examples. So for example, what is the value of an annual visit to the doctor, your annual checkup? <clears throat> um, well, Turns out um, the value, the mean value, is pretty comparable, um, several hundred euros in value. In fact, it's pretty close. It's about 300 euros is what the average value uh, benefit of going to a doctor is. But it turns out it's the medical profession is much more expensive. And so the actual cost that goes in to providing an annual checkup is actually a couple orders of magnitude more than what it costs to run a science center. And so on average, the return on investment for an annual checkup is around 300 to 500%, about three to five euros for every euro it costs. What about public education? Now, the only data I have is from US schools. Um, so what is a day in school? What is the benefit of that? And um, I'll put that in dollars. Turns out the actual dollar benefit of going to a day of, of school K through 12 <clears throat> is um, relatively small. It's on the order of $20, $30. Um, but the cost is astronomical. And so the actual return on investment of a day on school in the US is negative. It actually costs more to put a kid in school for a day than that kid gets in return on investment um, over their lifetime as currently measured. And even higher education, um, on average for all US colleges and university, at best the return on investment is break even. Um, that's the median return on investment is break even, which means that for um, more than half the schools, the return on investment is negative for going to higher education. Um, for the top 100 schools, it's 120% in the United States. Best top 100 colleges and universities. So clearly the return on investment for a day at a science museum is pretty darn good. It's pretty darn good. And I will admit that these numbers, because this was a pilot and because um, this was not a random sample, it was a self-selected sample, um, these numbers could be inflated. But even if they're inflated an in order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude, the return on investment is enormous. These are value, value, highly valuable experiences that the public derives immense satisfaction and immense basic well-being from participating in. So what's the conclusion? 
Well, there are a couple. So clearly, the premise of this talk, as began, is that science museums desperately need to better and more credible ways to demonstrate their public value. This new way of thinking that I've described about framing it in terms of well-being, personal, intellectual, social, and physical well-being, is a fundamentally important way and valuable way that we can demonstrate the value of these institutions. And it's a benefit that has real monetizable value. Um, but more importantly, this way of thinking about the value of museums in general and science museums in particular can be a bridge to the future. Because over the last 75 years, um, in this time of relative calm in Europe and around the world, um, it has been the time when science museums as an industry have come into fruition and the institutions that we know were developed. We were focused primarily on individual well being because it was an age of the individual. As we enter a more turbulent time, a time, frankly, more akin to the first half of the 20th century in Europe, um, where there's going to be all these events that royal society and even individuals will not be able to escape the general turmoil um, of mass migrations, of worldwide pandemics, and all that. We're going to increasingly need to focus not on individual well being, but on collective well being. But people are still going to be focused on their well-being. And so we can broker this ability, this capability that museums have to support well-being, to support really significant collective well-being and create a sustainable future. By responding to helping people know how to respond to current and future pandemics, by helping people adapt to the rapid technological change um, that is going to affect the quality of their life. Um, we can reduce social injustice and create social equity, particularly with recent migrants and the waves of migrants that are going to be coming into Europe and other developed countries is not going to be stopping anytime soon because climate change is going to affect all of us. And so creating resilience to climate change is also how we can help people support their physical, intellectual, social, and personal well-being. Um, and if we want to really be generous, dealing with climate change is not only dealing with the well-being of humanity, it's dealing with the well-being of every living thing on Earth. And so this, I believe, is the bridge to the future. And so if we think about what we deliver if, as we see as the purpose of our institution supporting well-being and think about how we can create experiences that support collective well-being, I think the future can be bright. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for a very insightful and deep talk anchoring uh, our work in the human evolution and also having a perspective towards the future of our institutions. I think this is something keynote speech, speeches seldom can achieve. But let's see how, how our audience is responding to this. Uh, we have had two polls uh, on the margin and they are, by the way, still open. It would be wonderful if you could still uh, answer the poll questions about John's model about uh, well-being as a motivation to visit museums and also uh, your understanding of this idea to monetize the value of a museum visit the way John described. And while I hope many of you are still answering the poll, I could um, have a look at the results as I re received them some 10 minute, minutes ago. So first of all, John, uh, a bit less than 200 people had responded the first poll when we were asking them 
that when they are personally visiting other museums or science centers, what type of well-being are they most, uh, most uh, striving to fulfill? And I think it's very interesting that only one person is uh, choosing none of the above. Everybody else were finding their primary reason. And uh, maybe it's not surprising that the largest number fell on intellectual well-being, 65. We are among science center professionals and science engagement professionals. But the second one actually is all of the above. Mm. At, at that time, that was 44 people, uh, 65 for intellectual. And then we have 29 for personal and 20 for social well-being. And only mm. one vote for physical well-being. What would be your immediate reaction to this result? Well, <clears throat> so first of all, it, you know, every institution is different. Um, uh, and that's not surprising. Intellectual well-being is certainly the what historically uh, museums of all kinds have focused on. They've defined that as their primary purpose is supporting intellectual well-being. Um, interesting enough, we recently did some research <clears throat> in the US um, as part of a project funded by the US National Science Foundation where we're um, bringing together science museum professionals and science education professionals to talk about the future of science museums. And we asked, um, we used our participants to poll members of their community. So we collected data from across the US, um, uh, something like to 300 individuals from across the US and ask them, what is the important well-being for you? Not about museums again, but um, currently, what are, what are your priorities in terms of your well-being? And <clears throat> um, about um, a quarter said um, uh, physical well-being, about a third said um, personal well-being, about a third said social well-being, <clears throat> and 7% said intellectual well-being. So the message here is that the good news is that yes, museums have historically supported intellectual well-being, but in terms of what the public primarily is looking for, um, they are looking for intellectual well-being, but um, if we merely support intellectual well-being, we are we will be catering to a minority of the public rather than the majority but the other bottom line is that actually um although there are dominant um experiences that people have um if a museum experience is not supporting all of those um it's not going to be perceived as useful so all of the above really needs to be the right answer thank you john uh Actually, okay. uh, I would like to make one comment. Uh, I don't see the questions at the moment, and because I'm on the same on the backstage, uh, I will be receiving all your questions and I will process them uh, while uh, you are doing other things. There was a one hour before we will have a fireside chat with John, and we will go uh, through your questions and we will also dig deeper, dig deeper into the poll findings. And my last comment, but I, I don't let you, John, comment at this point. We will come back to this when we meet later on, is that uh, our audience seems to be much more hesitant what comes to your model of monetizing, which might not be so surprising. No. I, actually, I have uh, tested uh, my board and also the Ministry of Education in Finland uh, sharing this pilot study results with them. So this is also something I'm going to share if you join us on uh, later in the afternoon, so please join this discussion about the value of museums. So thank you, John, dearly. It's been wonderful. And it's the best news is that we can carry on in an hour. Great. Yes, yes, John. Thank you so much for a wonderful keynote. It was always inspiring to hear from such a well-known and respected name in our field. And as Michael has just said, uh, please join him. Uh, please join, uh, join uh, you and Michael for the Q&A later at 4 p.m. Central European time on the main stage. Um, and thank you, Michael, uh, too. Uh, thank you. Now, 
a quick heads up for everyone to everyone that we are about to go into several rounds of sessions and networking so uh, there is a lot happening with topics covering science and society biodiversity exhibitions learning diversity and inclusion you can also use this time to visit the business buzz and check it in with our wonderful exhibitors and don't worry if you miss a session we are recording everything that you can always rewatch re later bye bye à plus tard <laughs>